Welcome to AgriTalk and thank you for keeping AT and Farmers TV. Today we are talking about avocado farming. And with me in studio today, uh, I am with two amazing gentlemen. That is uh, Alex Karani James, uh, who is the director at the Rural African Development Association. And he's also um, an agronomist by profession. Welcome to the show, uh, Alex. Thank you so much, Phil. OK. Uh, the other gentleman is uh, Kelvin Waweru. Uh, who is a consultant also with the Rural African Development Association and an agronomist by profession, Karibu uh, Waweru. Thank you, Philip. Let me start with you, Alex. When we talk about avocado farming, what is it exactly? Uh, avocado farming is the farming of a fruit tree. And avocado farming in Kenya was introduced around in the 19th century, around 1903, when we started farming avocado, as initially as an indigenous crop. Uh, but over time, as time goes by, I would say that avocado farming has really evolved and people are farming it and doing it as a business. And they are farming the modern varieties of avocados in the okay. country. Mm. When you talk about the varieties, mm. uh, how many types of varieties are out here? Uh, the common varieties which are being farmed in the country at the moment and the biggest one that farmers have taken uh, at a high level is a um, Hass avocado variety. But we also have the Pinkerton variety and we have the silver and also we have the giant and fuete. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why is uh, the Hass avocado the, the most favorite uh, out there? Uh, I would say first because of the market and the growing period. So farmers are really taking up the Hass variety as the best because it's easy to export and to get a good earning from it. And also it doesn't mean like the others don't really fetch a good market value, but it's basically the most common one because of what we said there amount it's of return it's getting to, to the farmers. Okay. Mm -hmm. But well, uh, when you say you are a consultant, what exactly, uh, what, is, what are you consulting? Uh, thank you, Philip, for that question. Uh, so we as Rural Africa Development Agency, what we do, we bridge the gap between extension services from the extension services organizations that are in Kenya and us. So what we basically do, we reach out to farmers, and try to give them information and uh, skills about production. We also try to um, give them information about the market. So uh, basically what we do, uh, most of the time we are in the villages with small scale farmers, uh, talking to them about production, the right variety, the best agro inputs to put on, as well as linking them to the foreign markets. Okay. When you talk about consult, um, um, uh, talking to farmers, uh, telling them a little about what they need to know uh, when they want to grow avocados, how has been the uptake so far? Or what are some of the biggest questions or uh, most asked questions out there? Um, I think the biggest question that farmers put in place is about the market. Because I'll tell you one thing for sure, Phil. M uh, uh, most of the farmers in the village, they do good job when it comes to production. So their main question is, after we invest in avocado farming, after my crop, after I plant my avocado after three to five years, and it's ripe for harvesting, where will I, will I get the market? So what we try to do, we try to link them with export organization that have been there for years. Uh, okay, they do ask some question about production, um, and so what we do, uh, we link them, we try as much as possible to link them to like agrochemicals industries that have these agro, agro inputs like fertilizers and uh, chemicals to spray and therefore now they can get information easily. Let's say I'm a new uh, mm -hmm. farmer who wants to venture in. Let's talk about the market being king. But even before uh, I start looking at the market, what do I need to have in mind? Oh, well, avocado is just like any other sort of investment because it will give you returns. But the basic thing is avocado definitely grows in the farm. So when you want to venture into the avocado business as a producer, you really need to have a sizable land. And else you also need to have capital to invest because you'll definitely need a little bit of uh, inputs to farm into, seedlings and everything else. So you have to have uh, spacious land, 
not really big, even a quarter acre you can produce enough for market and also a little bit of some capital to start up uh, your business. Okay. Mm -hmm. Talking of seedlings, mm -hmm. where do I get the seedlings? And what do I need to, to look when I'm getting my seedlings? Well, we advocate for what we call uh, seedlings which are clean. Clean seedlings will um, contribute a lot to the end product that you're getting. Because if you plant an infected seedling, at the end of the day you will have to cope up with a lot of losses when it comes to production or else you spend more money along the process of producing trying to control pests and diseases. So we have um, different uh, sections, or not even sections, but organizations that can help you to get uh, clean seedlings, clean in terms of disease, not clean in just terms of the, by the look. We have uh, organizations that, such as uh, the Carlo, and we have other organizations that uh, and companies like Kakuzi, which are certified by the KEFIS, which can give you clean seedlings. Else you can also try and do what we call grafting, whereby you have your indigenous varieties and you graft them into modern, with the modern varieties which are clean. You only need to get a clean scion from a modern variety and also you graft it with um, other indigenous varieties and that tells you will get better seedlings. Okay, mm -hmm. so what's the process of, uh, of planting? What do I also need to know when I'm uh, planning to plant? Uh, when you need to plant the avocados, uh, the first thing you need to have is a clean tilled land and after that you go and have to dig holes. Uh, where many farmers fail is in during the spacing of avocados because you have to be keen on how you're spacing your trees uh, considering that within two or three years your tree with trees will grow and then you want to prevent, to prevent them from shadowing each other or intertwining, preventing it from uh, to a point whereby you, the trees are not accessing the enough light. So what we do with this is we advise farmers to dig a hole which is two by two by two, we call it two by two by two feet. Uh, and when we are digging this hole, you have to check on, you separate the soil into twos. You have to separate the topsoil and the second layer soil. After you dig, you get the topsoil, keep it aside, and then you get the other bottom soil, which is a bit compact, and you put it aside. And that's where you come now with your plant. You put it in your hole. And in between one tree to another, we try to keep it around a seven feet space, by seven feet space. And then when we put in the plant into the hole, we try to advise farmers to start by mixing the topsoil and the other soil with farmyard manure, which is highly nutritious. You can have around a bucket or two and then you mix it to the soil and then you put your plant. Do not forget watering your plants. And another aspect we are telling farmers to be keen on is how you train your tree. Because in areas that we grow avocados in the country, we realize that there are windy sections or windy areas. So we try, as the seedling is young, to train it, you can give it a support by a stick and tie it towards the street side to ensure that it doesn't go towards bending or anything else that be pushed by the wind. After that, you have to check uh, the pruning season for your avocado after the trees grows. So basically depending on the variety that you're having, uh, that's what will determine the period that you harvest. We have the varieties like the giant which take up to three to five years before you get maximum production <coughs> of your fruit. But we also <coughs> have varieties like the pinkerton which is very easy to grow within the next uh, nine months after your planting, you're able to see the first flower. The house variety goes to two to three years where you can start harvesting too. So it's a, a good period for you to get your returns. Okay. You talked about the use of uh, manure. Mm -hmm. Why not fertilizer? Why not synthetic fertilizer? Uh, I don't so solely mean that you can use fertilizer. You can use a double phosphate in your planting, but we try to advocate for manure because it's quite organic and we are moving towards the organic. And this also helps you to control the maximum residual levels of your fruits to match with the guidelines of the export. So we encourage farmers to at least try as much as possible to use the organic produce as you're going up with your fruit. And also, it's easy to access. Every farmer, you realize that in Kenya, most farmers are small scale and they also have animals in their compound. So you can, it's easy to grab a little bit of the uh, the farmyard manure from either the farm cow sheds or even chicken and incorporate it with the soil. So that also cuts your cost. Okay. Yeah. Well, Weru, uh, you interact a lot with the farmers um, and they say information is power. 
So all the things that Alex has told us, where can these farmers get, how easy is it to get this information? That's a very good question, Philip. Because uh, like I said, what you're trying to do is you're trying to bridge the gap between farmers and the organization plus the market. And one of the things that we are focusing on is to try and get rid of brokers. Because what happens is that most farmers, they are really trapped by brokers. And the people are benefiting mostly from the production in any, in, in any agricultural business, be it avocado, macadamia, coffee, are the brokers. And so what you're trying to do is you are trying as much as possible to link the farmers with the market themselves. For instance, this is an organization I approached a while ago. I want to say its name on this show. And what they're trying to do is that they're trying to register farmers as individual farmers or organization so that now these farmers, they can uh, export, they can um, transport their produce from the farms direct to these exporting companies. So basically, but I want, to try to say, I want to say that brokers are not bad because in foreign countries, brokers are legally employed. I'll give an example of Israel. I was in Israel for one and a half years and what I realized is that brokers are legally employed by the farmers and farmers organization in the sense that these farmers, they do the production and then the brokers, they go to the foreign markets, get information about market and the prices and the demand and supply and everything and now disseminate this information to the farmers. But here in Kenya you find that the brokers, what they do, they get information, keep the information under the blanket and use this information to their benefit. And you find that the farmers are doing all the job of production, putting so much money into the business, but when it comes to marketing, they just fetch a little price. So as is rural development agency, what you're trying to do is you're trying to instill confidence in the farmers that you can do the production and still get the market by yourself through registration in an export organization as individual farmers, organization farmers. So um, along that process, we try as much as possible to register farmers um, so that they can form organization so that when they approach the marketing uh, organization, it becomes easy for them. Something else I'll mention. Uh, you talked about um, cost of production. For instance, when you get into any business, the, the fundamental question that comes into place is where will I get the capital? So, and you find that the only, the only best place the farmers, they can get the capital is through the financials, the banking system. So what we try to do, we try to instill the confidence to the farmers that you can approach the banking system and still get the, the financial support and do your business. So it's just a collection of a lot of activities from production all the way to the marketing. Okay. Uh, most of the avocados we produce uh, are for meant for export. How is the export market and what are the requirements? Um, uh, first of all, Kenya are very lucky to penetrate through the European market uh, because um, most of avocados, we sell them to the European market and Middle East. Uh, but the question in place is, uh, how is it easy to do the export, right? So what happens is that the farmers, they can do export themselves directly to the foreign market or they can use organizations that do the exports. I'll give an example, Kakuzi, which is a very good organization. So what happens is if the farmers want to export the, the avocados themselves, they have to acquire global GAP certification. And previous research shows that more than close to 300 farmers have already acquired the certificate for export, which means that this is a niche. We as consultants company, plus the government, that is supposed to cut and uh, get to more farmers, get them registered to global certification, which is quite a, a task to get the certification because there are a lot of standards, which I'm not going to mention on this show, that you have to keep. So uh, maybe the question the farmer in the village is asking himself or herself is how do I get 
to the foreign market? And the, the answer is simple. If you are not able to get direct to the foreign market, use the export organization, like Akuzi, I've said, get them, do the export for you, and all the other process to follow. Okay. If I use an organization like Akuzi, um, do they charge me and how much? As um, compared to have, if I've lo had looked for the market myself or looked for the global certification myself. So what happens is that when you approach organizations such as Kakuzi, there are so many organizations that do the export. I'm just using it as, a, as an example. So what they are going to do, they are going to do the export on your behalf in the sense that they are going to buy the produce from the farmers, in the villages, do all the processes, the sorting, because there's a whole chain of process that they have to observe before exporting. So they are going to buy the fruits from you as a farmer and take up to them, go through the process of sorting, cleaning, packing, uh, freezing, and export themselves. So the money they are going to give you, they are going to give you the money in the farm. It's not the money they get from the foreign markets. I think that's clear about on that. So um, what such organizations say, we come to you as farmers, we have uh, the compare prices in the market, what other organizations are doing, what the brokers are giving, and they try to raise that amount slightly so that now the farmers, they can get benefit from the production. Okay. Alex, mm -hmm. um, our way was talked a lot about our farmers being small-scale farmers. Yeah. And we, you had also mentioned that uh, avocado farming takes a while before you start harvesting your food. Yeah, right. What advice uh, do you usually give the farmers to do as, as they wait for the avocados to do? Because uh, being small scale, always money is tight. Oh yeah. You see, the period that is required for you to gain money from avocado, it's, I would say, I'll give it, let's give it an average of two years. But you can tell a farmer who was having tea or coffee that I need you to uproot all your plants and do avocado what he gonna be eating for the rest of two years where he will take uh, where he get money for the children what will he get like within a year or where he'll get the money to facilitate his own needs so what we advise farmers as they try to venture into avocados is because avocado farming right now in Kenya is like a shift you are doing a certain business a farming of uh, like coffee or tea and then now because the available market and good returns, you want to shift. You don't have to shift immediately. You don't have to wake up one day and uproot all your coffee or uproot all your tea bushes and start farming avocado because this will put you at a risky position for the period before you get the first fruit. So we advise farmers to do it in, I would say, I would call it quarter or in a process whereby you do a section of your trees and then you move next to another section so that within a period of four or five years you have sustainability whereby the first section that you planted your seedling is already producing so as you move to the next one you get in returns from the previous one and that is how you fully transform to a full French I would say avocado farmer okay yeah uh, can we uh, intercrop them <coughs> let's say coffee and avocado yeah it's a good idea to intercrop the uh, avocado, but it's not the best idea. It's good because, one, uh, it will still not limit you from getting avocados, but you'll not get the best. Why? We have some kind of pests and diseases which uh, become tough to control when you intercrop some crops like coffee and avocado trees. Some do it, here, yeah, but we try to advise people that it's easier to practice agronomic activities when you have an avocado farm by itself whereby you need sometimes like pruning you need a uh, good space for harvesting we will also prevent what we call intertwining of crops we have tree bushes which are around even three two to three meters high and when you have a small seedling under a bush tree of coffee that tells you it takes a long time for it to access the lighting it also takes a long time for it to expand and like this hard access to lightings and also the spread of the branches and everything else so it gets a lot of squeezing and this also limits your production level and also the other thing we say they like irrigation and again there are some things you might do when you're trying to control pests in coffee you might end up affecting the avocado young trees or 
other crops that are in between. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the two years or three years that I'm waiting, mm -hmm. uh, what am I supposed to be doing to my avocados? Uh, well, avocado is a really easy tree to manage. As long as you plant it, it well, along the way you only need to observe what we call a good pest and disease control. Whereby, I said, if you need to harvest the best of an avocado, you have to control the pest. And it's really easy to control the pest. I will give you a very nice example. I went to, to a county, and then I found a farmer who had planted pepper, the pepper that we do eat, the red pepper, along his avocado trees. And it struck my thought, and I was like, why are you planting pepper and avocado? And to my knowledge, the farmer uh, made me understand that pepper produces a repellent that controls the flies in avocado bushes, so uh, trees, I would say. So such activities that you don't really need to spray and use chemicals to control the pests and diseases will also act as a good way of, um, uh, as a good agronomic practice for your avocado trees. Okay, yeah. so farmers also have their own way of oh, yeah. dealing with this uh, pest Kenya, you know, Kenyan farmers are really smart, it's because we don't really get to understand why they do some some of their ways to to control pests and diseases, and which is a really good thing. And they can also learn from each other. I okay. Saying, yeah. Oh, well, mm -hmm. do we have uh, laws and policies that govern uh, the production and export of avocados in Kenya? Yeah. Um, the global gap certification. I know the question that can come into place is what's global gap certification? It's global good agricultural practices certification which means that it's not about just production it's not about quantity how much i produce to get the market but the quality because i can tell you for sure philip kenyans farmers are very good at production in terms of quantity but when it comes to quality that's why we miss the gap because um, for instance we use a lot of pesticide to increase uh, or chemicals to increase production a lot of um, uh, fertilizers, and the conversation globally is shifting from chemicals to organic farming, right? And that's why now we come in. We try to educate the farmers that we can still do organic farming, which involves use of little chemicals, and still acquire the, the best production, the highest production, and good market. Because I'll give you an example of a business, the French beans. Kenya, at a, some years back, we were very good in French beans um, production and marketing, both in Europe, United States, and Middle East. But what happened to French bean uh, business is the chemicals used, because farmers were putting so much chemicals, and when this, remember avocado is a, is a fruit, it will be taken by people, right? Besides other uses like making um, things like hair food and stuff, the greatest uh, use of avocado is consumption, and it will be consumed by people. So which now we try to emphasize more that let us observe good agricultural practices and shift the conversation from use of chemicals to organic farming so that now when these avocados get to the foreign markets, they can be easily accepted because what happens when they get to the foreign markets, they have to do testing. They take a few samples from the produce that you export. They do sampling, so they test diseases, pests, and the level of chemicals in those uh, in those uh, uh, avocado trees. So if they find that the levels are low, which means they are going to accept our produce, and the more you're going to export. But in the on the other side, if they find that the levels are high, that will kill our market. So that's when we come in. We try to educate farmers. It's not about quantity but the quality of the fruit. Okay. Talking about chemicals, uh, sometimes it is inevitable uh, for farmers not to use chemicals. Right. But is there a time span of the time from the time I spray to the time I harvest? Exactly. That's a very good question. So what happens in avocado is that uh, avocado, I would say it's a, it's, a, it's a crop that doesn't require much, has, uh, most of husbandry practices, or spraying, in the sense that once, once I plant that crop, it's going to take three to five years before I get the first harvest. So the only period that chemical application really comes into place 
is during pre-flowering. Because what happens is that, like you said, if you plant your avocados and there are no wood breakers around, the wind will come and blow the flowers. With no flowers, no fruit. So what happens is the farmers, they spray the avocado trees with some chemicals to hold the flowers into place and they are stimulants to stimulate uh, fruit production. So, and that's the only time now they do massive uh, spring. Besides the other spring, like control of, control of chemicals. But I would say that avocado is a good crop because it doesn't require much of those activities in place. Okay. Uh, Alex, um, uh, for farmers that, um, when, the, when, the, when the crops are flowering, yeah. the, do they self-pollinate or they also need uh, to have pollinators around like beehives? Do they need to incorporate that to, to help in the process of pollination? Uh, you don't really have to incorporate that, but it's advisable for the best of the, uh, the, the plant. Mm -hmm. And also you realize that most farmers in rural levels, they don't really do um, too many trees, but it's advisable. If you have many trees, one, you'll also get it's kind of a thing, uh, you get more earning. Because even when you install kind of beehives and such such things, at the end of the day, you have a double pick for you because you will get your avocados and also you get your honey from it, but also help in improving. But doesn't mean like if you don't have a, a beehive in your farm, your avocados will not produce. They will definitely produce. Okay. Yeah. Um, we will take a short commercial break, mm. but we will be back shortly. Mm. Uh, for our viewers back at home, um, we are talking today about avocado farming, but we are now taking a short commercial break. But we will be back in a few.